Today's message is going to be found in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 7 through 11. And if you're a guest with us and you're not familiar with the Bible, there's uh, some Bibles in the pew seats in front of you. Um, at the beginning is a concordance. It actually will tell you where 1 Peter is. It's located near the, the back of the Bible. And uh, our messages are founded on the Word of, of God. Amen. A number of years ago, when I was pastoring in Las Vegas, Nevada, we decided to do Joseph in the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat as a play for the community. And uh, one of the reasons why some churches across the country wouldn't do a play like that is because one of the characters is an Elvis Presley type character. And it's hard to find somebody who can do a, a good Elvis. It's not a problem in Las Vegas, all right? Uh, there are plenty of Elvises. Um, <clears throat> wise men say only fools. No, 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 no. There's no truth to the rumor that Pastor Tom was an Elvis impersonator, all right? Uh, no truth to that whatsoever. But I'm using the life of Elvis Presley to teach a lesson today. Uh, if you know anything about him, he died at the age of 42. Uh, he was a drug addict. Uh, he was addicted to food. He was addicted to screaming fans. He was looking for fame all the time. And soon after his death in 1977, his wife Priscilla said this about him. Elvis never came to terms with who he was meant to be or what his purpose in life really was. He thought he was here for a reason, maybe to preach, maybe to serve, maybe to save, maybe to care for people. That agonizing desire was always with him and he knew he wasn't fulfilling it. That boggles my mind that the guy who sold more solo albums and, and records than anybody else. He's number two in total sales just to the Beatles. That's it. And this guy never found his purpose in life. So if you think it has to do with finding money, you're wrong. If you think it has to do with fame and fortune, you're wrong. Finding a meaningful life has to do with living according to the, the fundamentals that we've been teaching over the last few weeks. And this week we're going to unveil something new, and it's the idea of ministry, and that everybody, say everybody. everybody. Every single man, every single woman, doesn't matter what your age is, you have all been called to be a minister. Not just Pastor Tom, not just Pastor Ryan, not just Pastor Robin over here. Every single one of you, if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have been called into ministry. This is what the scripture says, 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 7 through 11. But the end of all things is at hand. Ouch, that's serious. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. And above all things, have fervent love for one another. For love will cover a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. As each one has received a gift, minister it, that gift, to one another as good stewards or good ministers or good servants of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Would you bow your heads just for a minute? Heavenly Father, we need a revelation in this moment. We need to hear your voice, your thoughts on this issue. It's revolutionary to hear that everyone's a minister. So I pray, Father God, that the concept that is found throughout Scripture will be planted deep in each of our hearts and that we will take you up on your challenge today. I pray this today in Jesus' name. And everyone together says? In this little portion of Scripture, the word diakoneia is found. 
And it is found in many places throughout the New Testament. And it means to minister. It means to serve. It means ministry. It means servant. It even means deacon. I'm a little shocked sometimes at what people think a deacon really is. Many people think a deacon is a special title and that you should strive for that because that means you have power and control in the church and just the opposite is really true. If you strive to be a deacon, which is a good thing to strive for, it means you're one of the head servants in the church. It means that you're willing to do the most menial task because anything done to the glory of God is awesome. Who can say amen to that? You can scrub toilets to the glory of God. You can take out trash to the glory of God. You can do all kinds of things to to God's praise and God's glory. And that's why verse 10 is really our theme verse for today. Because it says everyone, each one of you, has been called to some kind of ministry. But what's important is the package that this verse is found in. It's found sandwiched in a paragraph that begins in verse 7, and it goes through verse 11. And verse 7 begins this way. The end of all things is near. Some translations put it this way. The end of the world is coming. So we know that as evangelical Christians, we understand that Jesus is coming back again someday. And even if you don't believe that's today or tomorrow or this next year, you're not guaranteed today or tomorrow or this next year. So for all of us, there is an urgency to be about God's business. Remember Jesus when he was a 12-year-old? He got lost in in the city of Jerusalem and his parents didn't know where he was. And they come back and they go, why'd you do this to us? And Jesus says, didn't you know I must be about my father's business? We're all supposed to be about God's business. The time is short. We don't know how much time we have. And if the end is really near, do you believe that people are going to hell someday? See, I think a lot of us Christians kind of put that out of our, out of our mind. We try and pretend that we can go about our lives and, and strive and, and try and make money and try and live our lives and enjoy our families. But if our next door neighbor is going to hell, it's really none of my business. Culture tries to teach that, doesn't it? Culture tries to to impress upon us that your religion is personal. But a Christian's religion is never, say never. It's never a personal thing. It's way more than that. Because if you believe someone's going to get hit by a truck and you can do something about it, you are obligated to do something about it. See, we believe as Christians that there's an urgency. We believe that people are going to hell. And verse 11, or I'm sorry, verse 8 says, above all things, have fervent love for one another. So if we really love these people, if we love our neighbor as ourself, if we love our enemies because the scripture implores us to do that, we have to tell them about Jesus Christ. We have to serve them in some way, some shape, some form. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Pastor, that's your job. That's why we pay you and Pastor Lugo and Pastor uh, Matt and Pastor Matt and Pastor Lynn and Pastor Ron. We pay you guys because you're the professional clergy. In the scripture, the Bible says that everybody is is a minister. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. And Jesus himself gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers. So so the whole context of this scripture is that, that Jesus has given gifts to the world. Jesus has given gifts to the church. So I guess you could say I'm God's gift to the world. That's what the Bible says. Now listen to what it says my job is, okay? My job is for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. My job is to equip you. My job is to train you. My job is to encourage you, to implore you, to to try and get you involved in ministry and to give you the tools and the resourcing so that you can be the minister of God that he's called you to be. The work of the ministry is found right here in these four verses. Not all of it, but some of it. Uh, Verse 7 is is prayer. Verse 8 is forgiveness. Verse 9 is hospitality. Verse 11 talks about speaking. How many of you speak? 
That's what it says, that speaking can be a ministry. It's not just talking about preaching and, and, and teaching. It's talking about just encouraging someone. It's talking about building someone up in the most precious faith. The pastor's job is to train. The, the, the parishioners are to minister. Are you available for ministry? See, I know people in this church, I've only been here for two months, all right? And I know people in this church who have been serving in ministry for 30 straight years, every week, some for 40 straight years, some for 50, some for 60. One guy a couple of weeks ago told me he had been ushering for over 60 years. That is to be commended. That is to be honored. But the reality is there's not enough of those people because you don't get a vacation from your ministry. I'm not talking about for a month. I'm not talking about for a couple of weeks. I'm not talking about seasons. But we are called to minister from the moment we're born again until the day we die. There is a ministry for us, something that God has us to do in his church. Now, now here's the question. Why are a minority ministering and a majority sitting in the pews? Well, the obvious answer is selfishness. It's hard to give of ourselves. We were born with something called a selfish gene on the inside of us. Now, I know you probably haven't seen that in any science periodicals or anything like that, but I can tell you a story that proves my point. Brian was a four-year-old boy, and, and he went to a birthday party with his mom, and, and they all were celebrating this birthday. They sat around the table, and a, a birthday cake was brought out, and he blurts out, I want the biggest piece. And his mom's all embarrassed and, and grabs him and comes over and says, Brian, 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 it's not polite to ask for the biggest piece. So Brian, in all sincerity, says, well, then how do you get it? <laughs> for him, it was a perfectly natural response. I, mean, I want the biggest piece. I, I want it for myself. We were all born that way. We see that in our children from the time they're born. None of them apologize for crying and waking us up in the middle of the night. None of them apologize for, for, you know, all the stuff they do from newborn until five and then ten. And maybe when they're about 30, they go, Mom, I'm sorry for the way I acted. But that's only after a revelation comes that selfishness is not how we were originally designed by God. We were designed to give. You see, it's what you give in this life that matters, not what you get. Philippians chapter 2, verse 4, forget yourself long enough to lend a helping hand. I think the number one excuse that I hear when I ask people, will you get involved in, in greeting or ushering or parking lot ministry or, or sound or technology or, or worship leading or something, when I ask that question, the number one response I get is I'm too busy right now. And so the idea is someday in the future I'm going to do it, but right now I'm just a little bit too busy. And sometimes that happens in our families, it happens in our church. Busyness is probably one of the biggest devices that the devil uses in our entire lives. Carly was a, a, a mom, she was staying at home one day, uh, she was in her sweats, she had no makeup on, she was sitting around the breakfast table and her, her five-year-old son comes on down and, and he looks at her and he says, Mommy, you look beautiful. She got a little embarrassed, and she's like, well, well, honey, I, I'm in my ugly sweats, and I don't even have any makeup on. And, and this is what he said, when you look like this, I know you're all mine. <laughs> I want to ask you, when does God know you're all his? Or are you so busy with your job, so busy with your career, so busy taking your kids from one sporting event to another sporting event, it amazes me the amount of people who tell me, you know what, when basketball season is over, we'll be there for you, Pastor. And then football season starts. When football season is over, we'll be there for you, Pastor. And then baseball season starts. When baseball season is over, we'll be there for you, Pastor. And then summer comes along and they say, We're, we got to take a break right now. T take a break? How do you take a break? You haven't been involved yet. It's because you're so busy in the things that you think are important in this life that really aren't. Bob Dylan sang a song a long time ago, you gotta serve somebody. Or if you're a Bob Dylan fan, you gotta serve somebody. 
I figured an older crowd might appreciate that one a little bit. Matthew 6.24 says this, you can't serve God in money. But it doesn't mean just money. You can't serve God in entertainment. You can't serve God in your family. Some people, family is an idol. Did you know that? That family is elevated above God. That's not God's plan. What, what amazes me in talking about Elvis Presley is that there is a church in Denver, Colorado, and it's called the First Presbyterian Church. And they worship Elvis Presley. I'm not exaggerating. This is true. Okay? Here's a man, ironically enough, who couldn't even get his own life straight, and there are people worshiping him. Doesn't it make sense to worship Jesus Christ since he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords? Doesn't it make sense to live someone who, or worship someone who lived this life perfectly in every way, shape, and form? Never sinned, never did anything wrong. This is the one who is worthy of our praise. What are we waiting for? But indecision grips our hearts. We're waiting for the right time. We're, we're waiting for an audible voice from God. You know, everybody wants to see the, the handwriting on the wall or, or, or they want to hear this booming voice. If you need a booming voice, give me your telephone number. I will call you on the phone and I'll say, Stephen, this is God speaking. God's calling you to toilet ministry. <laughs> or whatever it is. I, I mean, God has already called all of us to ministry. We have a responsibility to find what that calling is. And, and I think the only excuse that I understand a little bit is this feeling of inadequacy. When I was young, I, I got the feeling that the people on the stage were perfect, and we peons out in the pulpit, we were the sinners, and so they were the only ones who could truly minister. Now I'm a pastor, and I understand that my life is messed up, that it's filled with sin, that I have lots of ways to go, so someone has to do the ministry. It's broken people who do the ministry. It's people who are not quite perfect yet who are consumed, should be consumed with ministry. But God promises to qualify you for the work of the ministry. And that is because everyone, say everyone. Everyone's gifted for ministry. Every man, every woman... By, when, when you are born again into the kingdom of God, God bestows upon you spiritual gifts. Uh, when you were born into this world, you had natural giftings that were given to you. You have what it takes. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 puts it this way. For we are God's workmanship. The, the NLT says we are God's masterpiece. He's created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things. That's the service we're talking about. We can do the good things he planned for us long ago. I, I want you to, to focus on this word right here, masterpiece. Do you see yourself as a beautiful work of art? Do you see yourself as, as what the Bible describes you to be once you have been born again? This, this word right here in the Greek language is poema. The idea behind it is it's a, a sonnet, a poem, a work of art. That you are a beautiful work of art, a one-of-a-kind work that nobody in this entire universe can duplicate in any way, shape, or form. That you are a valuable part of God's family and Bethel's ministry team. And your value is not based on what you've accomplished up to this point in your life. That means you can be forgiven of everything in the past and your value is based completely on your relationship with Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? You, you see, let me explain it this way. My wife and I, where'd she go? She's playing musical chairs with me. She's over here today. And uh, Robin and I have uh, had the privilege of going on a couple of cruises in our life. And one of the things that intrigues me is they have art auctions at sea. Who, who's ever gone to a cruise? Let me see. Okay, a, a few of you have gone. Now, here's what's interesting. Um, why would you be inclined to buy art on a boat, but not somewhere else? I, I've, I've been intrigued by that. But more so, I've been intrigued by the fact that Rembrandt has a lot of doodles. You guys know what a doodle is, right? 
You're just sitting there doodling away. They found some of Rembrandt's doodles and they sell these things for thousands of dollars. It's a doodle. My three-year-old grandson doodles, I don't get any money for it. Robin and I will doodle on a sheet of paper. Nobody wants what we have to offer. But if Rembrandt left behind a scrap of paper with a little face on it, a tree on it, a bird on it, a figurine on it, all of a sudden it is worth thousands and thousands of dollars. Picasso, Van Gogh, their paintings now go for tens of millions, hundreds of millions. Recently, within the last year, Paul Guggen, a painting he painted in 1897, sold for $300 million. If that painting is worth $300 million, what are you worth? The Bible says you're worth more than all the wealth of the entire world. Right now, I, could, I can calculate the worth of the world is $241 trillion. The Bible says you're worth more than all the wealth of the world. Why? Because God fashioned the Swiss Alps, the Yukon Territory, and the Hawaiian Islands, and he fashioned you. You're created by the same artist who paints every sunrise and every sunset. You are designed by the same one who put a song in the magpie, in the robin, and in the nightingale. You are built by the one who hung the sun, the moon, and the stars, and he did it all out of nothing. And he took your life, your life which was built on sin, brokenness, darkness, and he elevated you to a new creation in Christ Jesus. Absolutely anything is possible when you start working together with God in the body of Christ. You have a genuine purpose that God has created for you because your value is based on your relationship with him. Your value is based on your rarity. People say, uh, yeah, I'm a one of a kind, yeah. Uh, well, you have spiritual gifts, you have a unique personality, you have unique experiences. You've probably heard the phrase, your misery becomes your ministry. And that's because for a lot of people, if you were addicted to drugs or alcohol or, or pornography or something like that and God delivers you from that, you become an expert in that subject and you can help the next generation or people your age get delivered from it. Some of you who've been divorced and you've experienced the pain of, of a family breakup, but, but now you're healthy in the Lord. So, sometimes your ministry is to take care of people who are going through that situation right now. My mother-in-law, she, she lost her husband uh, seven years ago, and, and she was grieving, and, and, and she was kind of just unproductive in life. And all of a sudden, she started leading a, a group called Divorce Care. And she like sprang to life. Out of her grief, out of her pain, out of her sorrow, she, she had a ministry that she could make a difference for the body of Christ. Verse 11 here says, if anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies. God gives you unique abilities. Now, if you've never thought about that before, I have a book that I've recently read. It's entitled Strength-Based Marriages. And uh, it's based on the Gallup Strength Finder Assessment. Now, I know you don't want to take a test, but this, is not a, this isn't a test with right and wrong answers. It's a test that helps identify what you're good at. And according to this book and according to this theory, there are approximately 34 different strengths that everyone possesses. One of the strengths that this book me uh, measures is, is like vision. Uh, one is focus. You have a, a, an ability to focus. Another one is empathy. You just naturally care for people. Uh, and there's a lot of these different strengths mentioned in here. And so our entire church staff and their spouses, our entire church board and their spouses took the test. Because I wanted to see how similar we were on staff. And they give you the top five strengths if you want to pay $15. And they give you all 34 strengths in order if you want to pay $99. So we paid $15. <laughs> and did we get an eyeful? And what I mean by that is out of all the people who took it, 40, 50, 60 people have taken it so far, no two of us have the same top five. 
Isn't that interesting? No two of us have the top same five. And so they do a little mathematical equation in here to help you understand what the likelihood is of somebody having the same top five as you. And the chances are one in 278,000. That means in San Jose, there's only four people in the entire city that are like me in any way, shape, or form. So I wanted to take it a step further. What about the same top five in the same order? Well, they do the math in here for you, and it's one in 33 million. So out of these 34 strengths, now remember, this doesn't include your personality. It doesn't include your gender. It doesn't include your your experiences. It doesn't include your spiritual gifts. It's just natural abilities. That's all it measures. There's only one in 33 million people that are like Pastor Tom. One person in all of California, there's no one else like me. Just in this state. Now listen, listen, listen. If I want to take the top eight gifts and put them in order, it's one in 700 billion. So that means out of all the people that have ever been born, all the people that are alive, and all of the people that ever will be born, there is no one in the entire universe that will ever be anything like me or like you. You are totally and completely unique. So you should embrace your difference rather than hate yourself or dislike yourself or not want something about you. Snoopy was on the side of the road watching all the kids go by and he says, I wonder why it is that some were born people and others were born dogs. It just isn't fair. Why am I the lucky one? (laughs) Have you ever looked up to heaven and said, God, I'm so appreciative of the way you made me. I'm exactly what you want me to be. And my uniqueness is incomparable. My uniqueness is unmistakable. My uniqueness is invaluable. My uniqueness in the body of Christ is irreplaceable. Your difference can make the difference for what we want to do as a church here in the Silicon Valley. I don't know if you've ever seen the old show, The Addams Family, or the movie, The Addams Family. Who, who's seen that? Eh, quite a few. Uh, I want you to watch this video here real quick. He's mad, so he's running away from home. Now, I don't know what you think of the Adams family. They're spooky and kooky and all that kind of stuff. But that character bugged me. I just want to be honest. I don't like hand. I know it's fantasy. I I know it's make-believe. But it was just too big a jump for me because of my my background. When I was a kid, I memorized 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And the Bible says that the, the body needs all the various parts of the body. So some of us are hands, and some of us are feet, and some of us are eyes, and some of us are ears. And the Word of God says every single one is needed. And this is what I know. If my hand is separated from the body, it will not survive. That character doesn't make any sense to me because a hand cannot operate on its own. It needs a brain. It needs the ability to think. It needs eyes to know where it's going. It needs ears to hear. These are all parts that are needed. And when the body is missing one part, the body suffers. If you're not involved in ministry, the body suffers. We're missing the important thing that you can do. And so this is what we have going on here at Bethel right now. And and we are making strides in improving this over the next few months and over the next year. We want to test, say test, every single person in the church. We want to test your spiritual giftedness. We want to test you through maybe a DISC personality assessment or a Taylor Johnson personality assessment, maybe a strength-based leadership book like this here. We want to help you discover who you are. 
how God has uniquely created you and what he's made you to be. And then number two, we want to train you. We want to invest time and energy. One of the things that we've done poorly over the years is we don't train enough. We don't teach people what they need to know to be an effective greeter or usher or, or parking lot attendant. You might say, Pastor, I've been ushering for 50 years. I know what I'm doing. Do you? And the reason I ask that is, has the world changed in 50 years? Yes. I, I mean, we have to be aware of things from a security perspective nowadays. I never had to worry about that 50 years ago. I never had to worry about that 20 years ago. But did you know in 2014, 10 pastors were shot in the pulpit? That's a real issue. That is a, a need. That, that, that's one way we can serve the body of Christ so that the gospel of God can be preached. And then I want you to try as many different ministries as you can until you find the one that is just for you in Jesus' name. And the reason I say that is because sometimes from the outside, a ministry looks fun, it looks interesting, it looks engaging, and you get involved and all of a sudden it's like, am I stuck here forever? Am I ever gonna get out of this thing? I thought working with kids would be wonderful and I can't do it any longer. Or, or, or I thought being out in the parking lot would be fun. We're gonna be flashing signs and, and welcoming people and telling them to, uh, we're so glad they're here. And, and man, it was fun for two weeks and I don't ever wanna do that again for the rest of my life. Especially in the summer when it's 100 degrees outside. And so we want to give people the opportunity to try different things. We want to give them the opportunity to, to, to change from one ministry to another. As we already mentioned, verse 7 says that prayer is a ministry. It is a way that you can serve the body of Christ. You can serve your community. I don't know if you knew this, but we meet every morning, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday to pray from 6.30 to 7.30. Today is our Easter kickoff. We're trying to get you involved in some way, shape, or form. We want you to fill out this sheet of paper and, or, or get online and fill it out or go out into the foyer and, and talk to somebody in a ministry department of some kind. And, and we want you to get involved. Prayer is a way that you can do that. For the next four weeks, we want to spend time every morning praying about the men and women who are going to come to church here on Easter weekend. Because did you know we're going to have over five or 6,000 people show up? And we need to be praying that they give their life to Jesus Christ. Amen? We want a revival in this city. All revivals begin with prayer. Verse 9 is about hospitality, ushers, greeters, parking lot. Verse 11 is about speaking. We all know how to do that. Some of us need to be small group leaders. Uh, it says to, to minister. We, how many of you have legs and walk? Okay. Did you know this Saturday, our first thing is happening, we're canvassing. We're going from door to door in the neighborhood and we're handing out flyers. I want to encourage you to do that. And you don't have to come here to do it. We will give you 100 flyers so you can do your block. Maybe you're five miles away and you don't want to come in here. Uh, maybe you're 10 miles away. Maybe you're in Morgan Hill. Guess what? In Morgan Hill, in Gilroy, if you're over the hill uh, in Santa Cruz, you can pass them out. Somebody will come just because you're coming to this church. I guarantee you, in Africa, sometimes they walk three, four, five hours to get to church on Sunday mornings. And, and they spend as much time as they can there that day, and they walk back. You might say, Pastor, in this culture, they won't do it. That's an excuse. Everybody needs Jesus Christ. Many people are just waiting for an invitation. We need technology workers, camera workers, sound workers, graphics workers, security team, cleanup team, lay pastors, visitation people. And everyone, say everyone, is called to be a Tychicus. Tychicus. Would you say that? Tychicus. Do it again. Tychicus. Name your next child Tychicus, <laughs> all right? I, I mean, some of the names in the Bible, but do you know what this one means? It means to hit the mark. This man hit the mark when it came to his life. He was able to dial in to what made life work. He found his purpose. And the scripture says that his purpose is 
He's a beloved brother. That means he's a part of the family of God. He's a faithful minister, and he's a fellow servant. Now, you might think being a faithful minister means he's an apostle, or he's a prophet, or he's a pastor, or he's a teacher. He's none of those things. He was just a helper. He's mentioned five or six times in the New Testament, and, and you always find him behind the scenes. You find him carrying a message from one city to another. You find him supporting Paul's ministry. You find him going to a, another group and bringing an encouraging message or word of some kind. But he's not a major player as we would consider them major players. You see, you're not called to be Elvis Presley in the church world. You might say, why, why are you bringing him up again? Well, because in 1977, when he died, there were 170 Elvis impersonators. Today, there are 85,000 Elvis impersonators. If you do the math, by 2040, one in three people in the entire world will be an Elvis impersonator. We don't need any more Elvis impersonators. <clears throat> what we need are servants of the living God. Who can say amen to that? <clears throat> three final things as we wrap up this message. Number one, he had a team attitude. He didn't care <clears throat> if he was the speaker. He didn't care if he was the singer. He didn't care if he was the usher. He didn't care if he was the message bearer. He didn't care if he was a letter carrier. He was a part of a team. And I believe that God is fashioning a dream team here at Bethel Church. I believe that God is going to reward Christians in heaven someday. That's what the Bible says. It plainly teaches that some of our works are going to be gold uh, and silver and bronze, and some of our works are going to be wood, hay, and stubble. I'm going for the gold. They assembled the dream team together back in the 90s. Why? Because they didn't want to take home wood, hay, and stubble. They wanted the gold. And God says that we can assemble a dream team where hundreds and thousands are coming to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. So he had a team attitude. Number two, he had a faithful attitude. 1 Corinthians 4, 2 says this, a servant must be faithful to his owner. This is expected of you. Can we count on you? We need you because th th this is an important thing. And, and listen, listen, listen. We don't need you in the sense that, that, hey, everything's so terrible here. Do you understand what I'm asking you to be a part of? Can you imagine if in 1992 they called you up on the phone and said, hey, Magic Johnson, Larry Bird, and Michael Jordan want you on the dream team? I, I'll be there. I would have signed up in a heartbeat. Well, Michael, Gabriel, Jesus Christ are asking you to be on the dream team. They're saying, are you interested in what they're about doing, what they want to get done? That means we have to have servant attitudes. Do you know what that means? It means a, a change in our paradigm. It, it means that we, we're not choosing to serve. We're choosing to be servants. Those are two different things. When you choose to serve, you're saying, I will do this temporarily. But when you're choosing to be a servant of the living God, you are saying, I'm available whenever you say. Whatever you say. If you say jump, I'm going to ask, how high am I going to jump? Jesus Christ himself in Matthew 20, 28, your attitude must be like my own, for I did not come to be served, but to serve. As you're wrapping this up in your minds, because I'm wrapping it up, would you stand with me, please? I'm going to ask pastors, deacons, <clears throat> elders to come on forward and put some anointing oil in your hands. And uh, there's a movie that's coming out right now called Beauty and the Beast. And uh, I've created a, another little playoff of one of their songs because I want you to remember what it is that we are supposed to be on. It, it almost boggles my mind that they wrote this song. Uh, the Candlestick sings it. Uh, I remember in 1991 listening to this with my young children at the time. <clears throat> if 
I can sing it, I'll try and sing it for you. Be our guest, be our guest, put our service to the test. Loose the tie around your neck, Cherie, and he provides the rest. Bulletins, Bible verse, why we only live to serve. Try the message, it's delicious. Don't believe me, ask the ushers. You can sing, you can dance, and your life it will advance. And a service here is never second best. Come on and join the program, and you'll get to know him. Be our guest, we are guest, and be blessed. Listen. In another verse, this is what he says. Life is so unnerving for a servant who's not serving. He's not whole without a soul to wait upon. Today, I'm going to do something a little bit different. And I'm going to ask you to be anointed for ministry. If you remember the Old Testament, if someone became a king or a prophet or a priest, a prophet would come and and lay hands on them and anoint them with oil, and it got really messy, but it was an, an indication that the Holy Spirit was going to come upon them and, in a dynamic and supernatural way and, and equip them and empower them and energize them for ministry. And so maybe you've never served before, or maybe you've served and you just need a, a, a little booster because I need a booster on a regular basis. David, as he got older, cries out in the Psalms, I need a fresh anointing. Maybe you need a fresh anointing. And so I want to encourage you to come on forward, have one of these leaders anoint you with oil, and then I want you to, to get as close to the front as possible. And, and if it starts getting crowded, I'm going to invite you right on up to the platform. And the reason I'm doing that is because we're not the only ministers here. We're all called to be ministers. Any person who wants to be anointed today, I want you to feel free to come up and that everyone's going to be anointed and we're all going to be prayed for in just a moment. So as the praise and worship team begins to, to sing right now, I want to encourage you, come on forward. We're going to anoint you for ministry in the name of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. 